and I am back chatting with my friend Dark Zero, the maintainer of Zero Linux, and this is actually part two of a, a video series we did this week. We, we wanted to get together and do a collab, and we wanted to talk about several different topics, and we had the bright idea we'd split it up. We do some of the topics for a video posted on his channel, so those of you that are not subscribed to is it Zero Linux Official, is that the name of the channel? Zero Linux, add Zero Linux. Just no, Zero add, Linux? Yeah, yeah add, okay. Add, add, and I will, link, I will yeah. link to the channel in the show description. So go check out that first video. And today's video will be part two. It's a continuation of some of those topics we were already discussing. But our main focus today is actually going to be talking about a new flavor of Zero Linux coming out, which is Zero Linux GNOME or Zero G, as it's yep. being referred to. Yeah, so, not to be mistaken with, uh, with Zero Gravity. Zero Gravity, yeah, the game. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about, well, first of all, briefly introduce yourself, and then tell us a little bit about Zero Linux, and then why you've decided to, to create this GNOME edition. Okay, well, I'm Dark Zero, or if you want my real name, it's Steve. I'm the creator of Zero Linux. Uh, I've always maintained the... Uh, the vision of having one flavor instead of multiple flavors, because the more uh, flavors I ha a distro has, the less quality it will have. Uh, I kept uh, I kept saying, "Oh, I will never create another flavor. I will never create another flavor." Until uh, I started messing uh, a little bit with GNOME, and I saw how easy it is, how much easier it is to maintain than KDE, uh, because. Here's the thing with GNOME, it's uh, you cannot modify it too much because the whole uh, goal behind GNOME is less and right. more, uh, less customization, more stability. So, That's usually the way these things go with software. The, the things that people perceive as easy to use, they're typically they don't have a lot of options. That's why yeah. they're easy. <laughs> you don't. Have, there's not much to choose from. That is true, mm. uh, but with uh, with GNOME, people say you can customize GNOME. Well, of course you can. You can customize anything, but was it meant to be customized? That's a different idea. Uh, that's a different thing. Uh, they they do host a lot of extensions on their website, mm -hmm. uh, but their mentality with uh, with extensions is we give we give them to you, but it's on you if you break your system. Right. Uh, so with zero uh, with zero G because I opted not to customize it as much as uh, KDE, but I did customize it, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but I didn't customize it as I didn't go as far as I did with KDE. I just included uh, eight very useful extensions that everybody installs after installing GNOME. I uh, I did a little bit of study behind the scenes. Uh, I saw a lot of people uh, on uh, Unix porn. I saw people on Discord. I asked people, uh, "What what is what are the extensions you use after installing GNOME?" Most commonly, I get dash to doc, blur my shell. Yeah. Those are the two most common extensions that uh, users install on GNOME. A few others include stuff like uh, GS Connect because they like to transfer files between uh, their computer and their phones. So I decided to include that. Everything else comes from the KDE side of me. Yeah. Well, you had gave me a link to the ISO, and yeah. I, I went ahead and installed it in a virtual machine the other day and, and played around with it for, for an hour or two. And, you know, just to get a, a good first look at this thing and some of the things I noticed. Well, first of all, let's talk about the, uh, the installation. One of the things I noticed was that the installer refused to run if I didn't have a machine that had eight gigs of RAM. So apparently that's a hard setting that you've chosen yes, for eight gigs I, of RAM for GNOME. Yeah, of course. And uh, that's the to reason, prevent the uh, yeah. potato laptop users from using it. There you go. Yeah. You you just answered it. Uh, a lot of people have the misconception that they can, they can install it uh, on a potato and to avoid uh, uh, people from installing it on a, a virtual machine with less than eight gigs uh, of RAM, because I tried it on a virtual machine, giving it just two gigs, like the, the standard that everybody gives a virtual machine. Uh, there was a lot of lag. Uh, 
and I, I needed to work and test everything with less lag. So I was like, we have to be realistic here. Uh, if I uh, if I set it to one gig, a lot of maintainers, uh, distro creators, and maintainers uh, set a hard li uh, limit to from one gig and above. So, but setting it as mm -hmm. low as one gig is a bad experience. So well, ge generally, like, the, these days, just because of the kind of RAM that certain applications like web browsers suck up, yeah, uh, anything below four gigs is really kind of unreasonable. Yeah, and I tried to to set it to four gigs as well. I did a lot of testing behind the scenes. I tried four gigs. It was still lagging, dragging Windows around in a virtual machine was really bad. And I tried to install it on one of my old uh, machines uh, that has four gigs of RAM. Mm -hmm. uh, once I had installed maybe 20% of the applications I use, it started lagging. So I was like, yeah. I, I need to set realistic expectations with GNOME. Uh, so I set it to eight gigs. That way, uh, no one tries to install it on uh, on less than that. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't notice. Experience. Yeah, I, I didn't notice any uh, major lag or anything. So I, I don't know. It might be a, a video driver issue. I don't know what vi video driver you might have been using no, in your VMs. Uh, the the machine I tested on was integrated graphics. So oh, you were using it. A, you're talking about on physical hardware. It was yeah lagging. Yeah. Oh yeah. And that yeah, was probably not lagging too much. Don't don't get me wrong. It wasn't lagging like major lag, unusable state. No, it was usable. Mm -hmm. But once you start installing your browsers, your uh, applications, your uh, everyday applications, it tends to start. You start feeling it. You start yeah. feeling that it's not as responsive uh, uh, as it needs to be. So I installed it on another machine, physical hardware again, with eight gigs of RAM. It was good. Yeah. I didn't feel anything. Everything was responsive. I even ran OBS. I well, ran... it probably was the RAM. Uh, yeah, yeah. It when I ran that. a system monitor, now I had a few things running at the time. Yeah. It wasn't like on a cold boot, but you know, it, it was using a little more than two gigs of RAM, which honestly isn't unusual when you're using yeah, your computer. And, and so, uh, I have thirty-two gigs of RAM. Uh, so I installed it on this machine that mm -hmm. I'm talking to you from. Uh, thirty-two gigs of RAM. I used it for a week. Uh, I managed to break it and make it un unbootable, but I'm a maintainer. Uh, that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I used it. Uh, it. It was amazingly fast, blazingly fast. But after I had all my applications installed and ran, uh, rebooted the computer on a cold boot, mm -hmm. ran HTOP, saw that it was using uh, 2.4 gigs on cold boot. That's that's we, about what I uh, it wasn't really a cold boot, but that's what I was seeing too was about two, yeah. two and something. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, you have to you, you have to uh, people have to understand is that the more applications you install, the more services will be running in the background. Right. Because applications come with services. And, and sometimes when you know whatever file system you're using, some of them uh, utilize RAM a little differently. Which is the next thing I wanted to bring up during the installation process is it uses the Calamari's installer, and it does let you choose between different file systems. The default you're going with is XFS. Yeah. The reason is, for that uh, is uh, quite simple. I deal with a lot of large files, mm -hmm. and XFS is the best file system for large files. Yeah, XFS as a standard, uh, it's been around for a long time in Linux, and it's still used a lot, especially in the, the server space. Yeah. But you don't see a lot of Linux desktop uh, distributions for whatever reason. I can't think of really any off the top of my head that default to XFS, and I don't know why, because it is a very stable, yeah. probably just as stable as Extend 4, which is kind of like the standard. Uh, ButterFS was also an option in the, yeah. the installer as well. Those are the only three. Uh, I, I, I really believe uh, in the rule of three. Mm -hmm. uh, don't have too much. Three is just enough. Uh, and how I many users really care about the file system? Not a lot. They Most of them, they know they have grown accustomed to Extend 4, EXT4. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm a so nerd. It, but if you had said, you know what? ButterFS is the default file system. That's what I would have installed, or Extend Four, you know. But and and obviously, like my grandmother, she wouldn't even know what the a file system is. You know, just yeah, too much yeah. choice is probably a bad thing there. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, with ButterFS, I'm offering just the ones that 
are most common to people. You got the nerds that install use use ButterFS. The extreme nerds use uh, ZFS. <laughs> Uh, the extreme nerds. Uh, ZFS is uh, for servers mainly. Yeah, but it, it's pretty much been the default for many, many years on uh, most of the Unix operating systems yeah. and the BSDs. So that's why BSD or ZFS. You know, we've always wanted it on Linux, but because of licensing issues, it's it's been yeah. Now now it's better uh, when it comes to licensing, but. I still don't understand ZFS, so I'm not going to include something that I will not be able to provide support for. Right. Uh, ButterFS, I can provide the minimum amount of support because I don't use it. I don't create uh, uh, snapshots. I don't care for snapshots. For me, in creating snapshots, because video, BTRFS doesn't allow you to create snapshots on a separate drive. There are They are working on it. But the the snapshots sit on the same drive because they're snapshots. In case you install a bad application that breaks your system to yeah. restore to, it's 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 neat. It's a neat feature, but not for me. I, I you know the snapshots that you get with things like ButterFS and ZFS and that kind of stuff is neat. But w those problems are already kind of being worked on in a different way because so many Linux operating systems now are starting to have these uh, snapshots of their own. They're taking these like these generations that you get in Nix or Geeks where you can just roll back to a previous working state. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it, once you're doing that, then the, you really don't need the file system to uh, no. to be taking snapshots for you. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think we're going to, I think every Linux distribution will eventually be doing that. Pro it'll probably be another 10 years out, but... They'll all have that that kind of rollback feature with snapshots and generations. Yeah, the the, the thing that I don't like about ButterFS myself, it's just my opinion. Please don't take it that I'm saying this in general. It's just in my opinion that ButterFS uh, to have uh, snapshots, perfect uh, snapshotting, even with uh, to be implemented with, uh, with Grub the way it does. You have to install multiple things, and you have to deal with multiple packages, and yeah. it's a little bit for the for the for the average user, it's a little bit too much. Uh, it is, but for but... the nerds, it's okay. That's why the option is there. It's for for the nerds. Uh, Extend four is for the beginners. I I left that in for the beginners, uh, so they know it very well. But the only thing uh, that I try to do is tell tell those people Xtend4 is becoming one of the slowest file systems to date, uh, especially when you deal with a lot of files. Uh, but Xtend4 deals with small files better than XFS does, for example. XFS is the same thing uh, as the XT4 when it comes to smaller files. It's very slow. If you have millions of small files when you work on websites and stuff like that, yeah, it tends to be slower. But when it comes to large file files like I transfer, like ISOs, like movies, TV shows, yeah. uh, XFS is flies compared to uh, ButterFS and uh, Extend4. But that's the uh, file system uh, selection. It's only three. You uh, the user is free to select whatever they want. And well, those were just some of the, the the things I noticed. You know, that stuck out with the installation. It's the standard Calamaris installer for me. The installation was quick and smooth. When I rebooted, here's, a, here's another thing I mm -hmm. forgot to mention. Uh, since we're talking about the Calamaris installer, a lot of people ask me that question. A lot of uh, longtime followers ask me the question. Why did I remove the package selection from Calamaris, the net installer from uh, Calamaris? Well, it, the simple answer to that is, is something you just said, because without them, it's so simple, so breezy. Yep. Just install, no issues. No, even if you don't have internet, you can install yeah. uh, Zero Linux now. And I, I, I did notice that it wasn't there, and I kind of appreciated that it wasn't there because especially for a distribution like this and you I don't know if you'll necessarily agree but being that it's your gnome edition having people install a ton of for example cute apps or some of the KDE apps that they used to 
Yeah. They might want to try some of the default GNOME suite of applications if they haven't before they start pulling in all of these other KDE yeah, and Qt like, dependencies for some of this stuff. Especially with GNOME, uh, because mm -hmm. today's subject is a GNOME edition, especially with GNOME. When you use Qt applications, they are not going to use, most of them, not all of them, but most of them will not be using the uh, the system theme because right. uh, the same issue with flat packs. Qt apps are made for KDE and Qt based desktop environments. Uh, I don't like the idea of cross polluting uh, frameworks, yeah. uh, package kits or whatever they're called. Uh, but on KDE, we have no choice on KDE because there's a lot of applications, uh, everyday applications that are GTK applications. Yeah, uh, there's a lot more GTK apps out yeah, there is the problem Q. with, with yeah, that way. But with the GNOME desktop, I mean, honestly, there's really like one cute app that I just absolutely could not live without. Which is? Caden Live. I gotta have Kate oh, live, yeah. right? Like that's the like I gotta <laughs> all the same. Yeah, like, there's no like other free open source it, video right. editor that I even want to look at these days. <laughs> yeah, like I say, there's a solution to every problem, but uh, <laughs> uh, for for theming cute apps, it's a simple thing, uh, as simple as installing Qt five CT and uh, yep. setting the theme to Kevantum, and all the cute apps will be using the the theme, but mm -hmm. you have to install a Kevantum theme. So yeah. not a GTK theme. Right. So, uh, yeah, but I don't like, uh, and in GNOME, it's, uh, it's people are less going to use uh, Qt-based apps on GNOME than people on KDE using GTK apps. Yeah. Uh, so a GNOME, that's why I like GNOME. I gr it grew on me, and uh, that's the reason why I decided to, cr uh, to create the, to add it to the family. But it's so stable. It's it doesn't break. I managed to break it because I was playing with Grub. Yeah. I wasn't playing with uh, uh, that. That with was GNOME actually itself. the next topic. Was uh, when I reboot after installation. One of the first things, obviously, you get, of course, is the bootloader. Yep. And the bootloader looked a little different. I was like, oh, yeah. they themed. Uh, you got the little uh, you know, Grub and and blue letters, and then you've yeah. got a, like a, a rounded gray box, and you got a little penguin icon next to zero G. And, and you will get the window I Windows icon next to if you have a, if you do a boot with. Do Windows. you have multiple partitions? That's nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's uh, in in it's staying in within the essence of zero Linux. Uh, we customize. This is the whole. Uh, I started off by with a tagline, uh, "An eye candy lover's wet dream." When I first started. But a lot of reviewers couldn't read that line because it was like adult R-rated or whatever. Uh, <laughs> PG thirteen, but... maybe. I don't know about <laughs> R-rated. <laughs> but that's that's what Zero Linux is all about. It's all about the eye candy. And with GNOME, I couldn't do that much because there's only so much eye candy. I mean, there's there's eye candy with GNOME, but it was it was there to begin with. You didn't. Yeah, you know, you, you I'm, I'm not do... using any theme in in the GNOME edition, right. uh, just because unfortunately the way th uh, the, the way things stand with Libet Beta, uh, not all GTK app uh, themes uh, have been updated to support it, and the ones that have been updated are using hacks to yeah. uh, to patch and to make the theme work. I'm not saying they not, uh, they don't work. They do work, but you always encounter an issue here and there, a discrepancy here and there. Uh, so I, I usually don't just... I usually don't even play with the themings uh, in, in big desktop environments like GNOME or even KDE. Typically, I just go with whatever their default dark theme is. I, dark, I don't yeah, even explore KDE. any other options. I just always go with whatever they shipped with, whatever was yeah, already there. Uh, users can do that, but in GNOME Edition, I had no other choice but to do that. Mm -hmm. And because I was targeting stability over uh, customization in GNOME, uh, and the stuff that I customized, of course, like you said before we started recording, it's uh, it does look like a KDE fanboy created the... Oh, yeah. Uh, and I'm going to show some... Uh, some screenshots but yeah when you first log in you get your your zero linux welcome app which we'll talk about in a second but yeah. also you've got the dock centered at the bottom it's like hey this looks like a kde fanboy slash mac os fanboy yep. designed this with the, yep. the top panel you got the nice uh like translucent 
dock and translucent panel and it looks really good but it doesn't look like a lot of other gnome uh, you know uh distributions yeah. right? not not yeah. out of the box you know and of course some of this is done with extensions you've already mentioned you were using the dash to dot dash extension to, dot, to, uh, dash to move to the dot, dot blur my shell mm -hmm. uh, to do all this but uh, as you can see there is no activities i got rid of this you got rid of the menu again my own opinion my own taste uh don't take it as i'm bashing on it i just to me seeing this grid of icons on uh, taking up the full screen whenever i uh, use gnome it's like uh, a, a desktop environment trying to become an ipad to me yeah. and I, I worked with apple i've seen ipads i've used ipads I've, i never owned an ipad but I wish I did because now I have comic books to read. But well, it, it it would make sense for for a touch device. But you're right for what we're doing, just standard yeah, I, point and click with a mouse. Like it and yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. It's wasted space having a full yeah. screen menu. Yeah, but some people like it, and I'm not bashing on those people. To have mm -hmm. they have all the right to like whatever they want. But for me, and since I'm the creator of uh, this distribution, I was like. And I'm coming from KDE, and I'm a KDE fanboy, KDE show, call me whatever you want, but I will never leave KDE. Uh, but I replaced it with Arc Menu. Arc Menu is another extension that I love mm -hmm. because it's a start menu done right. I wish Arc Menu existed on KDE. That's how much I like it. Yeah, Arc uh, Menu is well, yeah, one of the, the GNOME extensions that I often install on and GNOME there's, there's distributions. And there's something I... I want users to start using it. It exists. It's part of Zero Linux GNOME Edition or Zero G. Uh, it's called Extension Manager. Yep. Instead of going to the website and having to install an, uh, an add-on to your Firefox or extension on your Chrome browser, just launch this application. It's in the dock. Uh, it will uh, allow you, and it doesn't show you incompatible extensions to prevent you from installing extensions that will break your system. That's what I love about it. I noticed you also installed GNOME Tweaks out of the box, yep. which is something yep. I don't understand why every distribution just doesn't install. Yeah, the, the it's, it's, tool. A, it's a necessary You, you need that. Tool. It's, it's almost essential to have that. Yeah. <laughs> but yep. many don't. Now, going back exactly. to your uh, Zero Linux uh, welcome app, which I thought was just fantastically done. One yeah. of the neat things I immediately noticed was yeah. you know when I log in for the very first time uh, before the installation, you know it had the option. There was a button that said "Fix Screen Resolution VM" yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, "That's so nice!" Because normally I, I I can open a terminal and run the appropriate yeah. xrender command, but you've already got it where the button does it for me. I just hit the button, boom, yeah. it goes to the correct resolution. That's like that's smart. Yeah, <laughs> uh, because. Uh, like you, uh, I get frustrated having to run the xrandar command or going <laughs> to this, looking for the, which display setting to, to, to set the resolution and whatnot. Yeah. So it's actually, uh, it is the xrandar command. Uh, wrapped I, I, I assumed it was. I didn't look at the code, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's xrandar space, uh, sorry, dash s 1980 to 20 and and xrandar dash dash dpi 96 because if you don't set the dpi it's gonna make everything right. huge the text huge and everything so uh i decided to and the welcome app uh does look people will notice it it does look like the manjaro i, I was app. gonna say it looked uh, very inspired by the manjaro welcome is, app, which actually, i which, like, which is fantastically done too the manjaro yeah. team does a great job it, with, it's a fork that. done by, for me by one, <laughs> uh, one of the uh, distro maintainers uh, mm -hmm. of the cache os distro maintainers no, uh, okay. it's written in rust currently but i would like to announce on your uh, on your channel that you're rewriting it in haskell no, oh, okay. uh, it's going to become a uh, an Electron app. Ah, because Electron allows me because the 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 GUI that you see in the Welcome app was created by me. Yeah, uh, you, not, you know you're oh, going to get a lot of uh, Electron hate, right? Well, the front end is going to be uh, <laughs> uh, Electron, but the back end is still going to be Rust. Mm -hmm. But 
uh, there's a developer on Mastodon. Mastodon is so amazing. Mm -hmm. You find a lot of friendly people over there. I cannot say that. I wish I could say the same about Twitter. About Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but he offered to uh, to lend a hand because uh, it does need to, to to a little a little bit of modification. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was great because you, you, you've got everything there as far as, you know, updating uh, yeah. your, your system. Because I, obviously the very first thing, no matter what distribution you install for new to Linux users, the very first thing you should do after an installation is update the system because the ISO probably didn't come out this morning, right? And you yeah. always want to run the update. You've got installing your proprietary drivers. So your NVIDIA Public. users, obviously, are going to need mm. to hit that button right away. Yeah. Um, yeah, so and, everything uh, about that welcome app I thought was was well done. It, I'll uh, this <laughs> I'll I'll tell you why I I wanted to create this app. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's all coming from my own frustrations with Linux. That's mm -hmm. why I created the app, uh, and I wanted it to be as friendly as it can be for new users. Uh, for example, update Arch Mirror List. They, uh, not everyone uh, will know which <laughs> command to type in terminal. Yeah. Update the Arch Mirror List. Uh, because well, you, I, you, you go to the wiki and read, right? That's what they say. RTFM. Yeah, well, <laughs> good luck having uh, users read. Uh, but uh, update the Arch Mirror, uh, uh, Arch Mirror List. I, I, I have that button in there. Why? Because... Sometimes you try to install a package from the Arch repositories, you get the you get issues that the the, the mirror list is out of date or right. uh, uh, timeouts, and, and you won't be able to install the the package. So when you click that button, it's gonna fix it right up. Yeah. Uh, for fix it, uh, and you know as well as I do that uh, I don't know for what reason, but. We get a lot of key issues when we try to install packages, outdated keys, and uh, and that was a script written by Eric that mm -hmm. I modified a little bit, uh, and I created the fix new GNU PG keys. Yeah, and that, that, that does is... it for you, and you're back and up up and running, and you can install whatever you want. Single mm -hmm. button, simple. Uh, but installing the drivers, this is what I want to talk about. This is something uh, that took a while to create. Because I'm an NVIDIA user, yes. So <laughs> I needed something to fix my problem. Right. And does that so, button also give you, you like your proprietary Wi-Fi drivers or whatever? Well, no, 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 no. That's no, no. just, it's, it's uh, just strictly drive. video. Yeah, just strictly it's just video. For video drivers. That's. Uh, I'll touch on what you just said about Wi-Fi in a second. Okay. But uh, this is for strictly for video drivers, like for NVIDIA users and. Mostly for NVIDIA for, users. For NVIDIA users is really yeah. what the... It should be NVIDIA on the button is really yeah, what it should be. Right? I do have the ability to install ATI because, you know, some people yeah, have old... Some people ATI want the proprietary, really yeah. Or not some people have to have it, yeah. No, not proprietary. I'm talking about ATI, uh, old ATI. You're the uh, legacy cards. Legacy cards, yes. Uh -huh. Legacy cards. So, the, uh, and... If you notice, when you click either the free or the proprietary, option one is the same. Mm -hmm. It will uh, run LSPCI to show you which uh, GPU you have attached to your system. Not everyone knows. Some people got their computers as a gift, and they're not tech savvy, so they don't know what they got in their system. So I, by running the uh, LSPCI command, it will tell you what GPU is attached in order for you to select the correct driver. Okay. Uh, so for NVIDIA, I got multiple options because you got the latest from 900 series and up, and everything else is legacy. So yeah. everything else is legacy, but all the drivers that Zero Linux provides are built by me, not the ones on the Arch repositories. They're TKG patched drivers uh, that I built myself. There's the uh, really uh, series 525, uh, I think 470 and 390. But they need to they need to run option one to know which graphic card is attached before they select which one to install. For the for the open source drivers, uh, yeah. it's and, just and most people ADL. are gonna if, if they don't know what graphics card they have, they're just gonna be fine with the open source drivers anyway because they're probably not the kind of user that would even care. Uh, but if they want to play a game, then they will have issues. Yeah, but well, if they want to play a game, yeah. Yeah, they, they're going to have to have the proprietary NVIDIA driver yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and for the uh, open source free drivers, I just created that for the to differentiate between ATI and AMD GPU. Yeah. That's it. Because yeah. legacy uh, ATI cards don't work with the AMD GPU driver. Yeah. So you have to install the correct one. One other neat thing with your welcome app is the update system now, which I said everybody should do. I notice yeah. it doesn't run like a standard like Pac-Man yeah. SYU. It runs top grade. Or can no, run. It it's got three options. Three options. Top grade yeah. being one of them. And it's because of your video. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that, uh, uh, no, not your video. I mean, uh, it was part, we talked about it on the Patreon cast, mm -hmm. but it's top grade is a nuclear option. You, right. uh, you use the words. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be automatically run, but I did it. And yeah. I was I was pleasantly surprised that it, it worked. I did it because right. of the, our discussion on the Patreon cast. Yeah. Uh, but b those Patreon casts can be useful. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but when you update the system, update system now, you get the Alacrity terminal that pops up. And yeah, then you've got I, three I options. Terminal, yeah. yeah, you got one, just update your your standard Arch packages, right? No no big deal. Two is the flat. And Arch. Well, yeah. The first command yeah. is AUR. And AUR Arch. and the uh, Arch packages. Number two, update your flat packs. And number three, update everything, no matter how it was installed. So if you grabbed it from any of the programming language specific package managers it, it'll update firmware it, yeah. it literally and that's why it's kind of dangerous it's not yeah. dangerous it's just you have to understand that it's going to update things that normally are not part yeah. of a standard update yeah. and if you're, you're fine with that great yeah that's why i put uh, the warning on top in the, in the big <laughs> square a, uh, on top and a nuke a nuke in parentheses next to nuke. it so <laughs> uh just so people avoid it uh, mm -hmm. unless they know what they're doing but the, the the only reason i did that was because as we talked on the patreon cast some people might have docker containers those are huge right. mm -hmm. uh other people have git repositories they don't want messed with so yes that that, that was my pr thing is sometimes especially developers they've got specific pro projects that they're working in whatever yeah. language they're working in that it might are mess. built by some of these programming language specific package managers, mm. but they don't want that stuff updated until they yeah. they want it updated. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And uh, and I will let you uh, I will let you know that top grade doesn't update app images, so your app images are safe. <laughs> well, app images. Well, really, in flat packs as well, snaps as well. They if they're able to be updated and the de developer wants them updated they should be able to update themselves so really the user shouldn't have to exactly. manage that exactly uh, that's nice it's, well, it's there as an option but but honestly those package formats should take care of themselves yep yeah. and to go back to the drivers part uh, and the wi-fi why didn't i include wi-fi card drivers yeah because the basic ones are already on the iso the general ones that are used by the majority of the people are already on the iso because uh, there, most people use either Intel or Realtek. Right. Mm -hmm. But this is where the problem arises. There are some proprietary Intel and proprietary or uh, uh, niche. There's variations uh, of, of these things out there. Yeah. yeah. So those are up to the user to figure out. There's a million packages on the uh, drivers on the AUR. I'm not going to go hunting for a million different driver and include on my repository. Uh, when it comes to Wi-Fi, so far I have had no one mention any issue related to Wi-Fi because those general ones are already on the ISO, yeah. like the RTL839 or whatever, RTW839, DKMS. And honestly, and like that. everyone using Arch Linux or an Arch Linux-based distribution at some point probably, you know, we, we say RTFM, but you probably want to read the networking page yeah. on the Arch Linux wiki. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. to know how Ethernet works, if you're using Ethernet, just to know how Wi-Fi works, because there are going to be times when you're going to need that information. Because yes, at some because... point, at some point, things do break. I, I know we like to say, you know, things are stable, and it is for the most part. But but it's nice to to have that information. Hopefully, yeah. you never need it. But and users need to to to, to know how to figure out what uh, chip. Uh, a chipset uh, their Wi-Fi card is using, not the brand that is uh, stickered all over the, the adapter or whatever. You have yeah. to look deeper to understand which chipset it's using because 
on the AUR, if you if you want to find a driver on the AUR for your chipset, you have to know which chipset you are using. Mm -hmm. And the, easy, the easiest way to do that is by running Inc C uh, with the flag WA or NA, sorry, mm -hmm. NA dash NA. It will give you your exact specific uh, chipset, and you go looking for that on the AUR, and you can install uh, the driver like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do want to uh, report one potential bug I, I did notice. Like as yeah. soon as I uh, you know, rebooted after the installation, started looking around at some of the programs insta uh, installed on the system. Uh, it, you may or may not want this, but I, I probably wouldn't want new users to be able to just open Gpart it. After the installation, Gpart it probably needs to go away because it's still there. I included there. it on the dock for, so it can be accessed on the, from the live environment in case they want to partition their drive on the live environment. But it's still so, there after a proper installation. Yeah, I, I can't separate because yeah. the, the what you see is what you get so uh what's on the live will end up on the uh, if, you, if i remove it on live it will no longer be there on after the install yeah I, I don't know if there could be like some post installation i can do it on script, KDE, but on gnome you, you it can, didn't allow it yeah yeah because on gnome the dock is not i mean it's not dock. that big of a deal but but especially people that are really new users, they don't even know what gpart it is they may go around and and, yeah, delete um, their system. Right, their it, it would be very, very dangerous for somebody to to play with it. They didn't know what it we'll was. See. <laughs> we'll, yeah. With time, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to talk about the post installation stuff that I added in. Mm -hmm. uh, I added initialized Snapper. This one is made for people who use Snapper, but I don't know many that do. This button might disappear at some point. Yeah. Uh, switch to ZSH. Well. Uh, <laughs> well, for people who love ZSH like I do, so <laughs> included. I did uh, notice it, yeah, you were using Bash as the default user yeah, shell, always, which is I don't touch the defaults. I don't touch the defaults when it comes to shell. Yeah. It's up to the user to decide which shell they want. Uh, uh, restore de uh, default desktop settings. This one is a really neat little feature. It's a script that I wrote. Mm -hmm. It's basically. The base of it, the base idea comes from Eric, the scale command that allows you to restore the ISO defaults. Right. But I took it a lot further than that, way further than Eric ever did. Uh, it offers you two options because we now have two uh, flavors of Zero Linux. It will offer you, uh, an, if you are, it will ask you which flavor are you running, KDE or no. If you if you select GNOME, for example, it will use deconf uh, command mm -hmm. to uh, reset to to the ISO defaults. If you select if you are on KDE and you select KDE, it's gonna uninstall stuff, install stuff, move things around. It's more complex than, uh, but it's a good way it, because a lot of people mess with their system and they might break this their settings. This is a good way to get them back. And I noticed you'd had the, the decomp editor installed and, and ready to go on the ISO as well, yeah, the GUI. Uh, because it's a powerful tool. Yeah, it I is. I love it. I love for it. Those it's of, not on the dock, so no people can mess yeah. with it directly. No, no, I had to search for it, but it's one of those things that people should think of it. If the, those Windows users out there almost like, you know, a GUI, uh, like registry editor or something. It's something you wouldn't want to go in and just start playing with. Same thing with decomp. You, you got a ton of little settings you could go in there and tick on and off, but they're not. Yeah, they're, they're, just they're not the kind of settings like, like you'd go in like a your GNOME settings manager and, and you know play with yeah. the appearance settings and things. No, these are more advanced stuff that really people shouldn't go in and tinker with yeah. unless they know what they're doing. Yeah, that's uh, I do it via command line. It's it loads up my because with decomp. What people don't know, I'm going to be making a video soon about that, is uh, Decomp is not only a GUI tool. You can use it via the terminal as well. Sure. So what well, the GUI tool is, is just a front end to those yeah. command lines. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically what users can do is export. If uh, they install GNOME, they set it up exactly the way they want. Mm -hmm. They can export those settings to a single file. You can call it whatever you want. I, I call it zero deconf dot conf. Mm -hmm. uh, and I put it on my GitHub. That way, if I uh, want to restore them and I uh, for whatever reason, I just download that file and I run the deconf command to import the settings. So 
this is how I get. Uh, this is what I use to create what you see in zero G. <laughs> so uh, it's a powerful tool. I'm going to be making a video about that, how to re reset, restore, and import uh, your uh, GNOME settings, because DCOM can be used to reset to GNOME factory. So uh, think about it as Fedora, the way right. you see Fedora, pure vanilla GNOME. Mm -hmm. By running or DCOM pure reset, vanilla on Arch, even. I mean, it's the same Yeah, yeah, package, but yeah. I'm saying if you customize your desktop and you messed it up and you want to go back, blank slate, right. you run DCOM reset GNOME, and it's back to vanilla. Yeah. You, you can right. do it on, on zero G and you will go back to vanilla. You'll undo all my settings and mm -hmm. you get back uh, because some people download the ISO. They mess with it. They don't like it. They don't like zero. What I did uh, to zero G, they want to use van pure vanilla GNOME. They can yeah. just run the decomp reset command and they're back to vanilla GNOME. Yeah. So it's a powerful tool. You People have uh, uh, need to learn more about it. Don't yeah, play with it doctor. unless you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, I think another thing I noticed, well, that, there was a few things I noticed, but going through like some of the standard software that's installed, I think one of the things most people would immediately wonder about is you're using the GNOME Software Center, which makes sense because it is GNOME, but yeah. obviously Zero Linux hmm. has always used PAMAC. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, Manjaro and a lot of Arch based distros, that tends to be the best software center, the graphical software center. They all pretty much default to PAMAC. So, why GNOME software or okay. Zero G? Uh, GNOME software is very limiting. I, it is. I discovered that's, that's uh, why I was asking. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's very limiting. Like, if you look, if you open the GNOME software and you look for things like Paxic, or mm -hmm. uh, WTTR for the weather terminal app or whatever, you won't find any of that in there. Even though they're on my repositories and it's reading from my repositories, yeah. I've built those packages, but it won't find them. If you go to the uh, command line, they're there, right? The, yeah, of course. And uh, But I included GNOME software for one reason, because GNOME was meant to be stable. And if I offered PAMAC, people are going to start running PAMAC and installing stuff willy-nilly until they break their system. I wanted the GNOME edition to be very stable, to target stability and new users. They can do whatever they want. They're not going to be able to break it very easily. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a little Pac-Man on the dock. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the, the little Pac-Man icon on the bottom dock. What is that? That's Paxic. Uh, by one one of the uh, people on the uh, Endeavor OS forums, uh, it's a TUI that replaces no. PAMAC because this will give you access to Arch packages as well as AUR packages. Okay. Because GNOME software does not give you access to the AUR. GNOME software is just pure repositories and nothing but pure repositories, and not even that. If you have packages on your pure repositories uh, that are system packages, it will not show them. No. Uh, it will just show games uh, or email clients or browsers, stuff like that. But it's not going to show system packages. Like I can't uh, go uh, get a different Linux kernel, things like that from. GNOME no, software. you can't. No. GNOME software doesn't doesn't yeah. never did. Uh, at least as far as I've seen, uh, I could be wrong, but uh, I don't use it. I use PAMAC. No. I, PAMAC I, I honestly thing. don't really use it enough to say definitively that they've never done that. But, but that's why I included PACSEQ for the users yeah. who are advanced and who know uh, how what AUR packages <laughs> entail. They can yep. use PACSEQ. Uh, but the GNOME software uh, includes uh, Flatpaks by default. It supports Flatpaks by default. I made sure of that. Uh, because Zero Linux is moving more and more towards flat packs. I, you, I have exactly uh, 69 nice uh, uh, flat packs installed. So uh, I'm using more flat packs every day. Uh, because there's no, work. there's no flat packs installed out of the box on zero. No, 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 I don't and I actually I, verified that too when I checked it. I leave one that of the up first to the user. Yeah. Zero Linux is all about leaving the choices up to the user. It's just a, a UI 
And I only mentioned that just so you didn't get, because when you said you had 69 packages on the system, I wanted to make sure people knew that you didn't have 69 flat packs installed on zero oh, G. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm sorry. I needed to, to clarify that. Yeah. Uh, no, I have 69 flat packs on my own system, KDE mm -hmm. system, not on the, on right. the GNOME edition. So don't worry about that. You don't like flat packs, you're free not to install them. But you never I'm have to use it, right? Uh, it's, it's not like. You don't have to use it. It's there if you want it, but you don't have to use it. Yeah, I'm going to skip all the rest because uh, if you notice that zero, uh, zero G does not ship with Wayland enabled by default. It's I did uh, I did notice that on the uh, start menu when you choose just standard GNOME, GNOME it's actually GNOME with Xorg and not GNOME with Wayland. Yeah, it, it says GNOME, but this mm -hmm. time GNOME. Usually when you install GNOME, when it says just GNOME, plain GNOME, it's GNOME Wayland. Mm -hmm. by the, by default but since i disabled wayland uh myself using uh gdm settings uh so uh, now gnome means gnome on x11 uh i decided that because i cannot use wayland myself efficiently at least uh i decided i'll leave the option to the user they want to go bleeding yeah. edge they have the choice. It's I'm probably best for now, too, because if you've got a lot of NVIDIA users, especially, yeah. you know they're going to have issues. And at least with Xorg, a lot everybody of should be okay. And if you really want to experiment with uh, Wayland, Wayland, you can. Hey, you just go, have to go enable for it. it. Yeah. yeah, just enable you it. You make that choice, but you, you can't have people that have bad experiences out of the box. And, and a lot yeah. of NVIDIA users would have a bad experience out of a the lot box. Of, uh, Here's the thing. A lot of my users are laptop users with hybrid. Yes. Yeah. Hybrid That's still has an issue. always been, been yeah. the bane of my existence. It's always been that way in Linux for some reason. It's been that yeah. way for years. Uh, hybrid graphics. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to open that can of worms. I, t I tell the, I just took the safer route and I told users, I don't have uh hybrid, so I cannot provide support. Read the arch wiki and, Figure it out on your own. Just throw your hands up in the air and say, yeah. I can't read the arch wiki. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for the people who are like uh, Bash, to stick to Bash, I added apply all my Bash just to give it a flare, a, a little bit uh, of a design flare. It's yeah. my settings, but you can customize them to your heart's content. Yeah, uh, people that want different default user shells, I mean, that is a simple, like, five second install. To yeah. install whatever shell you want. <laughs> like, yeah. this, and I that's made it even good. easier. It's a button now. It right. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, some other software stuff. And you've got both the GNOME terminal and Alacrity. I'll I'll uh, explain uh, Alacrity for uh, to you uh, in a very simple. Well, well, I I know the explanation. Alacrity is the best terminal emulator on Linux. That's the explanation. This is one of the explanations. But since I'm a fan of yours. Uh, and you use Alacrity, so I decided to include Alacrity. Simple explanation. <laughs> now, I say Alacrity is the best terminal emulator. There will be some people that can't yeah. use it because if uh, you, you mentioned like legacy graphics cards, if you've got some really old graphics card, Alacrity will it's be a problem lag. It's because lag. it's GPU accelerated. Yeah. I again, noticed, that, that's I not something most people are going to experience, but you're going to have like, you know, like 2% of your users are going to open the Alacrity and say, well, what's wrong with this thing? Well, GNOME terminals, what you're going to have to use. Just uninstall yeah. Alacrity. <laughs> no, but I noticed the uh, uh, GPU acceleration only today. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm, I'm telling it to be transparent. I set the opacity to 0 0.75 or whatever in the VM. But since the VM doesn't have GPU acceleration, it was becoming black. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. oh yeah, Alacrity is GPU accelerated. That's why. Mm -hmm. uh, but... I included it just as a, a, a as an homage to you. <laughs> well, if, if you want to test why you should run Alacrity rather than GNOME Terminal, run the tree command in both. Tree uh, oh, basically oh, yeah. reads your entire file system and prints out a tree. Run tree on root in GNOME Terminal. Time it. So time tree slash, and it'll give you the time. It's going to take like 30 seconds. You're going to run time tree on root, and Alacrity is going to take like 10 seconds. <laughs> Because the GPU acceleration helped it spit yeah. out all that output. And uh, uh, there's another thing I didn't mention in GNOME. One of the tweaks I did to GNOME was, you know how I keep mentioning that Nautilus, I, I hate Nautilus, I hate Nautilus. Yeah. 
because I went to the Nautilus settings, I had three settings. I was like, huh? I'm coming from Dolphin where settings will take you half a day to discover. Yeah, because you've got to decide whether you want to do double click and single click. And of course, yeah, that's a big debate on it. That's it. Right. <laughs> folders before files or files before folders. That's it. That's as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. uh, so I decide, and there's no right click open as admin, as root, basically. Right. Uh, I found a, an, a, a tweak on the AUR that brings that back to Nautilus. Uh, and there was other tweaks uh, from the AUR I found. I, I went on a, in a rabbit to a, I dug a rabbit hole so deep when I went to uh, when I started working on Gnome Edition because I went to the AUR, type Nautilus dash no. on the AUR because I wanted stuff to make Nautilus more like Dolphin. Well, not much I could find. The only two things I could find, uh, three things I could find, was the right click open terminal because. For some reason, when they first released GNOME 43, there was you could only do right-click open console, the new console that mm. they released with a C, not a K. Uh, so I needed something to replace console with. I added the something called open any terminal. That allowed me to add alacrity to the right-click uh, yeah. context menu and open as admin. And the last one was share. Right click share. You have more patience than me because if there was one GNOME application that I would have to swap out with something better, I'd get rid of that file manager right away. I tried. Uh, but uh, you, I, it, it's tied. I, I don't know how tied it is to uh, their desktop environment now. I know back in the GNOME tied. 2 the GNOME 2 days, you actually could not uninstall a Nautilus without uninstalling GNOME because Nautilus, the file manager, controlled the icon desktops. It still does. So it's, <laughs> I don't know why they do that. I think they do that so people can't get rid of their horrible file manager. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the same thing goes for a Nemo in Cinnamon. And Cinnamon, because it's a fork. Yeah. It's a fork of the GNOME 2 Nautilus, yeah. Yeah. But uh, I tried a lot of file managers. I tried uh, Thunar. Thunar yeah. has a lot of uh, a lot of nice, cool features it and does. whatnot. I like it. it. It feels out of out of place on GNOME. Yeah, Although it's, it uses because it's still GTK. using you know, older GTK libraries. Yeah, it feels yeah. out of place. I wanted to. It doesn't look screens. quite right, but it's still a great file manager. They're all great. There's yeah. a lot of great ones, except Nautilus. Uh, <laughs> please. Uh, so, uh, but the, because they, the, it breaks the immersion in in GNOME, mm -hmm. I'm I'm sort of a perfectionist. If it breaks the immersion, it's not consistent. It's out. Yeah, most but, people probably wouldn't care. It's only the power users. Yeah, that, that hang out in a file manager anyway, and they're they're going to be the ones they know enough. They'll go get a different file manager. Yeah, they can. But for me to to ship something consistent, I kept Nautilus and I tweaked it the way I want with the options that I use on a day to day basis using packages from the AUR. Right. Uh, but that's it. That's that's GNOME edition. It's not very uh, very much customized. Uh, well, I just still early it. days, right? Um, are you considering this a beta or is it ready for prime time? Oh, now we get into the nitty gritty <laughs> of, okay. the, of the whole the whole discussion. Uh, it is ready. People can uh, people can build it for mm -hmm. free. Why do I say for free? Because if you want me to put in the time and build you an up-to-date ISO, uh, I kind of put it in, in following what we talked about in the previous video. It's a donation-based uh, project now. Uh, if so you if want, they want to ISO, download the ISO you've already built, uh, they have to pay for it. Yeah. And uh, if they want it for free, of course, it's free and open source software, meaning everything's out there available for you. If you want to yeah. go build your own ISO, you can. But the work you put in to build the guide. ISO, you're going to get paid for. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I even created a video guide on how to build it. It's three easy steps. Yep. You run one command to add. Uh, no, first you add the repo to, to your pacman.com. And it has to be on Arch. And not all Arch distros. Some Arch distros, uh, for some reason, Garuda, I have to add Garuda to the list of unsupported because I had a user on Garuda that wasn't able to build it uh, for whatever reason. But Garuda have so many tweaks. God knows what they have. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, there's Garuda, Artix, Manjaro, 
in cache OS, you cannot ins use to, to build yeah. the ice. And, and Rx, I can tell you the problem is it's not system D. It's not system D okay. and they don't use our pure arch repositories. Uh, uh, cache OS, they use some weird architecture V3 of, uh, of arch repositories. Uh, Manjaro, don't use plain, don't use. Uh, and honestly, the, uh, no one really should probably go about building the ISO themselves unless you just want to do it for fun. If you're doing this to save a couple bucks, it's not worth your time. Just, just pay this man for his ISO. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> Thanks, like... <laughs> dude. But uh, I encourage people to to build it because uh, for free sometimes because I want them to get to the nitty gritty of how to use Arch. Right. Uh, and people tell me I don't want to have to install Arch to, just to build your ISO. Well, you either can pay me to build the ISO or you can just download any Arch-based distro except the ones I listed. Oh, that yeah. was KOS. But and, and honestly, installing Arch. You don't like need to the... install it. Just boot into a live environment yeah. with uh, with uh, with one that gives you enough cow size. But just uh, just installing Arch to the point where you get to the command line, you know, yeah, yeah. you are. It's it's like a ten minute process. Like if you're complaining that that's a problem, really pay this man for his ISO because you you don't have time for for anything else. <laughs> you can just install the pure ISO, a pure Arch ISO. You can just download it uh, from from their yeah. website, spin it up, install it in what 15 20 seconds oh, because yeah. it doesn't install anything i can install base or uh, a base arch without xorg or anything you know without a desktop without anything. Just, just turn uh, just tui yeah i mean uh, i can i, mean, I can uh, do a TUI. base install i can do a base install of arch without even reading the wiki in like 10 minutes and like yeah. that's not even a hard because because of the arch install script well, I mean, I just run the commands, but yeah, with the arch install script now, you, you don't even do have to do that. Second, you just in, in two minutes. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So you can do that and just uh, edit your pacman.conf to have the uh, the repository where the the tool that we okay mm -hmm. we now use a tool that is home made. Uh, it's homemade by uh, one of the uh, team members of Zero Linux, Kadisa. Uh, it does more than build Zero Linux. He added the ability to build the latest Arch ISO just by running. The tool is called ABS, by the way, right. uh, Arch ISO build script, uh, because you can build the latest Arch ISO by running ABS dash V vanilla yeah. Arch. It will pull down the latest packages and give you the latest and greatest uh, Arch ISO. Yeah, basically, Not zero yeah. Linux, just yeah. Arch ISO. Oh, so, so it's basically the same way the Arch guys are building their ISO every month or whatever schedule yeah. they're on. It, it just builds builds that ISO for you. For you. And I built it on my machine. It took me exactly three minutes to mm -hmm. build the ISO. You get the latest and greatest. Instead of yeah. downloading it, they uploaded it on the first. You downloaded it on, in the middle of the month. You get updated packages. Mm -hmm. So now you say you it, it to took three update. minutes. Uh, of course, the Arch ISO is not like everybody else's ISO because the Arch ISO... It's very, very minimal, right? There's not yeah. much on that thing. It's 800 megabytes. It's yeah, really it's, it's really small. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, uh, ABS allows you to do that, but it allows you to build zero Linux. So mm -hmm. uh, you can build either the KDE version or the GNOME edition or Arch ISO. You got, it builds three uh, ISOs. So it's a neat little tool. I want, I'm thinking of telling, uh, giving him permission to put it on the AUR so more people do it. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a, a, a download link uh, on the website? If those for the want tool? To, no, for the uh, for zero G. If oh, people no, that for want zero G, no, uh, there isn't yet. If, if you go on the website, uh, I cannot see what you're showing the users, but if you go on the website, there's a gift uh, box and uh, a bubble that says something. Uh, a, a purple gift box uh, that says uh, we have a gift. <laughs> Let's see. You, a purple it, gift box. Ah, I see you, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the bubble, it says uh, we have a gift. Uh, so when you click oh, where it says click here, no, it's not obvious because it was hidden. Because on Christmas Day, we made it hidden and they had to hunt for the treasure. We couldn't make it obvious. We couldn't make the link uh, obvious. Okay. So, but when they click on the click here, they're going to get a pop up uh, that explains everything. Uh, it explains okay. why it's behind a paywall uh, donation wall. Uh, the ISO is behind a donation wall, and it explains uh, and it links them to the build if they want to get it for free for because if not everyone can donate, 
uh, if they can't donate and they want to build it for uh, for free, they can. The code is there. They just have to follow the video. It's three easy steps. Uh, even even beginners were able to build it on my server. They were like, I'm coming from Ubuntu. I didn't never built an ISO in my life, but following your guide was super easy. It, mm -hmm. it takes a while on lower end system and uh, slower internet speeds, but on my system, it, it takes five minutes to build. So. It, yeah, and okay. my internet connection is really and bad. if they want to pay for it all they have to do is click on the the donate button yeah on uh, the main, on the main page, page uh, there's a donate button that oh i see it explains my situation in lebanon and mm -hmm. then tells them about the uh because as we talked in the other video uh i am in a bad situation in my country so uh i need to monetize somehow and this is the first step uh Gnome Edition will become free for everyone, just like the AD KDE version, and it will join the KDE version. Uh, but until I figure out my uh, my bearings on how to monetize better, uh, once I am able to monetize on YouTube, have merchandise and stuff like that, uh, only then will the Gnome Edition become the other side of the coin for free, like everyone can have access to the ISO. Just no one thing. I want mm -hmm. the users to know one thing: that getting the ISO will get uh, is getting you outdated packages. I'm not building the ISO every time I send it to someone. It's an ISO that is already ha that already has been uploaded and is sitting there. I just share the link. So, uh, by building it, you will get the latest packages in, and uh, no need to update after installing. Uh, other than that. We need to monetize our projects. I need to monetize my projects better. I'm still working on it I'm, uh, because Lebanon is not an easy country to get money into. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but so far, I have someone uh, helping me uh, to, to understand things. And I'm not a, uh, a guy who understands, uh, what, do, what do you call it, marketing and stuff like that. Right. Uh, my thing is technology. I don't know how what marketing and how marketing works, but basically this is zero zero G. It's very simple. It was built uh, with the beginner user in mind. Stability. Uh, not a, uh, not a lot of things were customized except making it look like a little bit like KDE <laughs> because I am a KDE guy, uh, and it's always gonna uh, trickle down to everything I work on. So you uh, still are, are you still looking for um, contributors to the project as far as people helping you with code or artwork things like that? I am. Uh, so I got someone on Mastodon, like I, I told you earlier, uh, mm -hmm. for the welcome tool. Who is going to be helping me turn it into an Electron slash Rust app? I, I can't wait for the, the Electron app. That's going to be awesome. It looks awesome. He showed me screenshots of what he's working on. Yeah. It's still behind the scenes thing. I cannot share right now because it's not the final look. Uh, but from what I'm seeing, he's doing an amazing job. Uh, because the, uh, if, if I don't know if you noticed in the current welcome app, if you click uh, a button to do something, the welcome mm -hmm. app itself becomes unresponsive. You cannot resize right. it. You cannot click buttons. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an issue. I think uh, uh, the way it was built by uh, the developer. Uh, and it has another issue where if you click the application installer button, uh, you go to flat packs. Uh, you install a flat pack. It's done installing the flat pack. You close the terminal. It will not show you that this application has been installed. It will not keep the check mark. It will get rid of the check mark. Whereas if you install regular packages, it, once you install it, it's going to keep the check mark. It's going to detect that this package is installed. So there's a lot of issues in, uh, on the back end that we're going to be working on. GTK development frustrates the hell out of me the little bit i've played around with you know yeah. making my own little gtk stuff I like there's that. there's there's so many quirks to like it's so hard to get like the simplest things to work yeah uh, people uh, keep asking me why is it taking so long to create this to create that you think we are printers we print code mm -hmm. well now we can rely on chat gpt mm -hmm. but <laughs> like you know i can write the same code and make something at the command line that does anything like instantly. But when you, with GTK, because you're having to create this user experience and having to think about a UI and, and 
it's a whole different level of complexity on top yeah. of what you would already be doing with something like a, a terminal application, for example. Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, okay, we need to make it simpler. And mm -hmm. the way I did that with the current uh, tool was I turned everything into a bash script. Everything yeah. in the back end is a bash script. And I think pretty much everything that's kind of simple should just be I a bash, bash script. I love that, bash. Because that, that just makes sense. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, and you can copy commands from... Anybody uh, can understand it. Anybody can edit it or bug fix for you. Like Everybody knows bash scripting on Linux, right? Because that's yeah, always... Google, bash is always there. And if you Google uh, how to do this in bash, you're always going to get the, the exact command. <laughs> and now with chat GPT, this chat GPT bot uh, <laughs> thing, you can ask it to com uh, create a bash script. Yeah, just something. write me a bash script. Yeah, it will, <laughs> you just copy and paste the code and you're done. You, you created your script. Yeah. Uh, it's easy to understand and that's how I love it. That's why the zero hello tool runs only bad scripts on the back end. <laughs> I love it. I, I have control. I can modify the script. I don't need to modify the tool. I just modify the script and it's done. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, zero, zero yeah. G is going to appeal to a lot of uh, beginner users. Yeah, I, I and can't wait to see, uh, see what it, what it becomes in the future. Cause I, I think it's, it's not going to become anything. Here's the thing you, you just touched on a, on another thing. This is it. This is zero G. It's That's not it. gonna. Uh, it's not gonna get any better than this. It's. It took me uh, three months mm -hmm. of testing uh, and decision making, mostly decision making. Which uh, extensions do I add? Which ones do, don't I add? And stuff like that. But otherwise, making it took only a, a week or two right. because I, I. I'm a maintainer of a distro. I know which packages to remove and which packages to yeah, add. Yeah, you've already done all of that. It's just, it's just the GNOME stuff. Yeah, that I, just you had wanted, right. I just wanted to, to know which... Uh, and in the next release, when GNOME 44 comes around in March, I think uh, March 23rd or something, uh, and PopShell gets updated to work on, uh, on GNOME 44, I'm going to be including PopShell hmm. because a lot of users love tiling their windows on yes, GNOME. Yes, they do. <laughs> so I, I'm like, I'll include it, no uh, problem. But that's the only thing that's going to be added to uh, to to zero G. But that's it; it's going to remain the same. Wow. I'll be just tweaking it a little bit, like uh, tweaking a few settings here and there, and that's it. It's going to look the same. It's not going to change. It's uh, that's it. It's done. Uh, it has reached its potential. Because uh, touching no more than I already did will just break it. Right. right. So as long as it works, don't mess with it. Exactly. If it ain't broke, it ain't no. break. <laughs> right. broke, if don't it ain't broke, it. don't fix it. Right. Yeah. Well, so uh, I think it's done. So, and I would like, I, I'm happy to announce that so is the KDE edition. The mm -hmm. KDE edition now will only be receiving tweaks here and there and updating Calamaris every time I cut because there's a new version, major version of Calamaris coming. Uh, coming soon version 3.3 yeah. so you're not gonna you're, you're not gonna break people's workflow one day with either edition where no, no, all no, of a no. sudden and everything is that's different part. right i'll alex I'll, I'll say one thing i've mm -hmm. been using manjaro on my htpc for a long time mm -hmm. but i have to i have i am sad to say i have to switch to windows because hdr is not supported on linux yet so i watch a lot of hdr uh but uh, on uh, my, what I love um, about Manjaro is uh, I only update once every three months. Mm. I don't use the AUR with Manjaro because I know I don't want to break Manjaro. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I every time I update, nothing happens. It updates and it still it doesn't break. So I decided to do with Zero Linux the same thing. So now. Uh, even users who installed it last month or the month before or the previous release, if I release one in March, because I release on a quarterly basis, the once I release in March, the ISO I'm going to release in March, they just all they need to do is run update in their terminal and they're going to get everything I updated. No need to reinstall uh, fresh. So the, the new ISOs are only for new users, not for current users. So uh, this is how Zero Linux will forever remain. I've done my work. Uh, I have uh, served my sentence, as they say. <laughs> uh, but now the work 
is just waiting for April to get a laptop, a hybrid laptop, so I can provide more hybrid support. But and the tool will be updated, of course, as I said. But that's it. Well, uh, I'm happy good. to say that Zero Linux is complete. Yeah. Uh, I well, was going was... to mess around with window managers, but then decided <laughs> I'll do it for myself. I'm not going to. Well, do it we'll, we'll get the Xmonad edition at, at some point. But, uh, <laughs> we're going to get got... Xmonad. We're going to get Qtile. We're going to get Awesome <laughs> for me. But uh, for everybody else, they have to learn how to build their own. But yeah. Uh, that was pretty much uh, all I had on on zero G. Uh, any final yeah, it's thoughts? Yeah, very simple uh, distro. Very yeah. simple addition for the. Any users. contact information you want to dis disclose? Obviously, I'm going to link to yeah, you know, the website and all of that. I have my Patreon, my fundraiser, of course. Okay. I prefer people uh, go to uh, uh, donate to my fundraiser rather than Patreon for now because Patreon is uh, kind of a thing that I need to figure out the tiers, what to offer for the tiers, because if I offer the same thing for every tier, it's not going to be ins uh, it's not going to be beneficial. Uh, people are going to say, hey, we're not getting anything extra. So why would we pay on a monthly basis? Uh, for now, I prefer people donate to my fundraiser. It helps get the money faster and they charge less on <laughs> Patreon charges more. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's my fundraiser. They can find me on Mastodon. I left Twitter. Uh, I am one of the qu Twitter quitters. Uh, I'm only on Fostodon and uh, YouTube, and of course Discord. Yeah, I'll, I'll you link to your support Discord. Yeah, I'll, I'll link to your you YouTube everything. as well. Yeah. Yeah, I'll send you all my uh, all the details. Yeah, just send me an email uh, with it, and I'll pass it along to the viewers. And if they uh, if they want the ISO, I just need to uh, clarify one thing. If they want the ISO, if they uh, donate and want the ISO. Yeah, they can message me on fundraiser, send me a private message, uh, contact, uh, let me let me tell you exactly what the word says, contact campaign. All it right. says contact campaign. It will allow them to private message me so I can reply back to them because I cannot private message uh, a donate, uh, uh, donate uh, someone who donates uh, directly. They have to message me first. So they tell me I want uh, I would like your zero G. I will reply back with a link to download the ISO. Otherwise, they can build it uh, from Git directly from GitHub. The video is embedded on GitHub, so they just click and follow the, the video guide, and they have themselves a uh, neat ISO mm, and cool. everything. Yeah, they have to read the thread, of course, that I will update constantly uh, on my forum uh, to see whatever I ch because I'm very transparent. If they follow me on Mastodon or Fostodon. They, they will see everything. I'm very transparent. Everything I update in the ISO, I post about it. And I ask users what would they want. And it's a give and take kind of. Yeah. Well, Thank you for uh, yeah, this. was fun. For this. Yeah. And, I'm, and uh, hopefully I, I, uh, everyone enjoys Zero G. I think they will. I know the couple of hours I spent playing with it, I, I was pretty impressed with it. So I think fans of Zero Linux that we're wanting a GNOME experience rather than a KDE experience, we'll definitely want to check it out. Thanks yeah, for hanging out with me, time. and uh, let's do this again sometime. All right. All right uh, and uh, peace out and love. Peace. Keep the love coming to Linux. What he said. All right. <laughs>